the word culture straight down. Isn't it just coincidental that the word culture has seven letters in it and I created the seven pillars? Yeah, huh? How about that? I was fortunate enough to have two influential cultures that I worked for and was associated with um, in my career's journey. One of them, of course, the United States Army. Very distinctive culture. Any other veterans in the room? The second culture, very distinctive, some of you may be familiar with, uh, is Southwest Airlines, one of the most studied companies in America's MBA programs during the 80s and the 90s, and still studied by quite a few university students today. I can tell you that these two cultures not only had an impact on me and my journey and how I view uh, my personal life and my professional life, but it's the only two cultures that I worked in and was associated with that I cried like a baby when I went in the Army. No, I was not drafted. I took a pay cut of more than 50%. I was bagging groceries at the commissary making more money. And the second time I cried in my professional life was when I had to make a very tough decision for family reasons uh, to keep my daughter in school in Albuquerque and leave Southwest Airlines. When you look at the United States Army and you look at an airline separately, you think, what do these two have in common? The idea here that I want to advance is that organizational cultures can have similarities with other professions and other companies as much as they might appear on the surface as being different. And I would submit to you that if you take a look at and study, whether it's casually or formally, study other organizations and their culture and see what is there that you might integrate into your own organization or in your own professional journey, okay? And some of you have small groups of employees. Some of you have larger groups of employees. Uh, the fact of the matter is developing a winning corporate culture and keeping it is harder as the organization grows uh, by population base based on his mentorship and also that of Colleen Barrett. Uh, unfortunately, Herb left us January 3rd of this year. Um, Colleen is, is uh, still very much alive. How many MBAs do we have in here? There we go. Now, before you start running for the doors and want to throw me out because it says culture eats strategy for breakfast, I know you MBAs had to spend a lot of time on business strategies and such for your thesis papers and so forth. But Peter Drucker says culture eats strategy for breakfast, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say strategy is important. Strategy has significant value, but culture needs to live at the same level as your organizational strategy. It needs the culture needs to live at the same level because otherwise you could potentially have the most brilliant strategy. You may have some failures, and then you come back next year developing your next year's strategy or your five-year strategy, and you say, well, that was not a good idea. That sure failed. Hang on a second. Relax the back. It may not have been your strategy that failed. It may have been that the corporate culture wasn't able to execute. Make sense, gang? But you got to get creative. You've got to ask questions that are HR and risk management friendly, but still gets the answers that you want, because what I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, these four answers, why do I keep doing that, Treasure? Commit to hiring for attitude, okay? This is not a Walmart parking lot. This is my Fry Superstore, my friends from Arizona. This is my Fry Superstore with a three-mile radius of household income of $122,000. Undertake corporate evangelism. Hey, you guys on the left side of the room here, I'm not talking about drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm talking about getting the tattoo. Okay? I'm talking about the tattoo. 
This is about being involved in a cause, okay? And how you get your people to the point to where they feel like they're part of a cause. Share everything with your employees, from receptionist on up, with the exception of salary CFOs, okay? Share everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, the financial, the industry, the crisis, the pitfalls, okay? Because some of you are going to continue to grow in the industry of ocular tissue, okay? And some of you are going to move on to other organizations in your life's journey. And if, if, if there's anything that I hope you take away from here today, other than a few ideas, is that the idea that you can take things about corporate culture and they can be transferred and transplanted no matter the industry, profession, profit, or nonprofit. So for example, there was one year at Southwest Airlines where we failed to increase our profit annually. So for instance, the year before we made like 62 million, and then this year we only made like 57 million. And all of us in the marketing and sales department thought we were gonna get fired, okay? We go to the annual marketing conference, there's about 100 of us, it was in Austin, Texas at Barton Creek, I'll never forget it. And we thought there was gonna be a big announcement about scaling down this, whacking our budgets and advertising promotion. And Herb Kelleher comes out on stage and says, we're increasing advertising and promotion by 15%. I don't know where the money's coming from, but that's what we're doing. Whole place erupted and went absolutely nuts, okay? And we were a company fighting against other big budgeted companies, make no mistake about it. But here's the smart thing that they did right behind it. Remember, we'd never lost money. Just so happened one year we had a little hiccup, didn't make as much money. Herb's wild turkey and cigarette budget was unbelievable, man. So you got you can't be going backwards on that, okay? You can't be going backwards. They created a program, a very efficient company already. Some of you all know about Southwest, know about the efficiencies, maybe study it. Very efficient company but they rolled out a program and allowed people to put teams together of employees. You could decide who's on your team, okay? If you were really smart, you got a diverse team, you get a flight attendant, a pilot, a mechanic, and a ramp agent, and a customer service agent, marketing person, put them on your team. And you came up with ideas to save the company money. And if your idea was implemented, you got points. So if we save, if an idea got adopted and we saved the company a million dollars in year one, we get a million points. We got six million points on my team. Wasn't me, I wasn't, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. But we had six ideas, we got, uh, or maybe it was four ideas, ended up with six million points. I furnished my whole house out of a catalog with Thomasville hardwood pecan furniture. Yeah. And think about all of these teams doing this across the company. And I've forgotten, I need to go back and research that and integrate it in the talk. I've forgotten how much it saved the company in year one, all these teams' ideas that were adopted. Incredible, huh? Okay, how's that translate to nonprofit? Well, I can't do a profit sharing program. Hmm. Well, we can talk about saving money. Oh, there's the idea. Let's talk about saving money. So what do I do? I implement an expense saving program that gave people cash bonuses based on how much money we spent on the telephone, I'm going back to the late 80s, early 90s, how much money we spent on long distance telephone charges back then, Federal Express, UPS, okay, other mailers, this and that and the other thing, come up with the idea, make teams come up with the idea on how to save money and guess what? If it's adopted and we spent X in this category last year, and we're spending Y down here, 50% of that savings is going to you in a bonus. You can do that in nonprofits. See, it's not, it's not against the law to have a revenue over expense at the end of the year. Okay? I will tell them, hey, we've got a problem in this area politically, we got a problem here financially, Here's what I'm doing to work on it, okay? And I also let them drive the meetings. I'll let the receptionist drive the meeting. 
I'll let a coordinator, I'll let a lower level manager drive the meeting that is my meeting of salespeople or group of executives. Why? Because they're learning how to run meetings. B, they feel like they're participating at a much higher level. They get excited about it. And now I'm getting traction on that, I'm getting traction on that feeling of being part of a cause. Does that make sense, gang? It also helps if you allow them to pick a corporate charity, or in your case, you say organizational, organizational charity, okay? Once they pick that and everybody decides as an organization, that's who you're gonna focus your resources and volunteer time on. So mine one year um, in, in the nonprofit that you can allow your team, your staff, your employee group to adopt and really get behind. It, it's, it's, it's just incredibly empowering and the rewards are unbelievable. If you wanna know a little bit more about how it all got started and, and, and how it spread uh, at Southwest Airlines, there's a couple by the name of Kevin and Jackie Freitag uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, they wrote a book called Nuts. They interviewed Herb Kelleher extensively for that book. And as a result, there's a lot of companies that are having their people read that book today or, of course, in studies in MBA programs and so forth. Uh, it is called Nuts. It's still out there. Uh, and as you can see, that is not Photoshopped. It is a henna tattoo. Uh, but it is not Photoshopped. Herb, pick the most important. Again, this is not linked uh, to your polling app. I want to take a stab at it. Something that's not even up here. Man, who said mentoring? Good for you. Anybody else? Take your poll. Colleen Barrett, uh, President Emeritus of Southwest Airlines, said anytime you're seeking to influence, you're asking people to do something, you're trying to influence their behavior, in their personal or professional lives, you have just taken on the role, you have just taken on the role of a leader. Personal or professional life doesn't matter. If you're trying to influence them, you've taken on the role of a leader. <laughs> this is a toughie for my peeps in Arizona in the summer. Because every CEO and every company in Arizona has covered parking or in a garage, and heaven forbid should you park that Ferrari somewhere else out here in Scottsdale other than in covered parking or in the garage. But I'm using this as a metaphor, okay? This is a symbolic metaphor to think about what perks you can give up that you have, personally or professionally, to your employee group, your direct report subordinates, that you don't need, and it sends a strong message that you care. And you can do it monthly for employee of the month, you can do it quarterly, and I'm not kidding you people, When I we, we had a garage, everybody parked, this is what kills you, everybody parked in the garage, everybody. But guess whose spaces were closer? The C-suite, closer to the elevators. I gave my space up permanently. Never used it in the seven years I worked at that nonprofit company. Never used it. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we had employees that were just punking each other, to use a current term. They were punking each other saying, hope you're enjoying that space, gonna be mine next month. It's incredible and everybody got to park in the garage. So think about something that small can have such a huge impact. What perks do you have that you can give up? Hey, by the way, if you don't have any perks, time to start negotiating. I'm just kidding, manager, directors and VPs, okay? But listen, someday you will. You don't have any direct reports today, someday you will. Think about this, you have no idea how far these kinds of things can go and the mileage you get out of them as a leader. So, 
if I had to boil it down, who's dimming the lights for me, Clarence, for this? And just right there is good. That, that's plenty. That's plenty. People want to be able to take notes. <laughs> the overachievers. If I had to pick, if I had to pick two things to say in a leadership bio, in a magazine somewhere, I would say my role is A, to develop people to be the leaders of tomorrow. And B, to clear roadblocks out of their way today so that they can do their job. Okay? I'm going to show you a quick video clip from the movie Hidden Figures. Anybody not seen it? Okay. You will after this. You're going to run home and get it off your Netflix. Hidden Figures. Taraji P. Hansen and Kevin Costner. Right? And there are two teaching moments in this bathroom scene. Two teaching moments in this bathroom scene. Watch this. Teaching moment number one, Kevin Costner failed at. And that was, he did not recognize the roadblocks. Now, this is based on a true story. Of course, the movies are dramatized. But think about the pressure that this man has on him in his role to get us to the moon before the end of the decade because the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, mandated it and said we will put someone on the room on the moon before the end of this decade. That's a lot of pressure. But he allowed that pressure to cause him to not recognize some roadblocks. In the old days, in leadership classes and training, we used to call that, you got to do a little MBWA. Anybody ever heard that term, MBWA? It's very old school. Uh, Kevin and I are the only ones. <laughs> it's called management by walking around. Get out of your office and walk around. And if you were able to do more of that, he may have seen what the problem was. That was teaching moment number one, he failed. Teaching moment number two, I think she was pretty clear about what the problem was, don't you? Huh? She was pretty clear. Teaching moment number two, he excelled at, and he took care of it immediately. Not, I'll get back to you next week. Not, let me check into it. Not, let me take it under advisement. Not, let me check with general counsel. <laughs> okay? He took action immediately. I love it. That bathroom scene, oh boy, I couldn't have done that any better myself for my speeches. <laughs> Lead with love. Ken Blanchard and Colleen Barrett. She gifted this book to me. October 18th, 2011. I think it came out in 2010 or maybe early 11. This is a fantastic read. It's mostly about Ken Blanchard interviewing Colleen about her approach to leadership. So it's a question and answer, question and answer. Very easy read. Herb Kelleher did the forward. And when we talk about leading with love, Herb even goes on to say in the forward, People who thought they were destined for failure and had administered necessary discipline with care, thoughtfulness, understanding, and ultimately pure and unflinching justice levied by mercy. Which means sometimes you do have to engage in tough love. You must always lead with love, even if it's tough love. Tough love could be having a counseling session. Tough love could be making a termination. We are all trained, if, you, if you've, who has been to some leadership training and conferences? Got a lot of people in the room here done that? Okay. One of the key things that you've heard, and it's still true today, is that focus on the behavior, not the person, right? You focus on the behavior, not the person. That's very true. It will always be true. But in leading with love, when you're disciplining, and they will appreciate it. You may have to make a termination, but in the end, and it lingers, it will affect the rest of your employee group and your culture. 
And you already know that because if you've experienced that, you're spending 80% of your time dealing with that as opposed to 80% of your time leading with love and the cause of the organization. I don't think that people understand that once you have a position of leadership, whether it's manager, director, or CEO, you have already arrived. And everybody that is subordinate to you cannot change that. Only your boss can change that. So let your people engage in challenging you. Let your people engage in debate. You're already the boss. I let my people come in. If they want to jump on my desk and say, DC, are you listening to me? Do you hear what I'm saying? I hear you, but I'm not catching the merits of what you're saying. Can you rehash the merits of this? Okay. Maybe we don't take action on what they want to do and the direction they want to go in. But I have given them the forum to do it. And then if we don't go in that direction, I will look them in the eye and give them an explanation and say, sorry, it didn't work out this time. This is the reason that we're going in this direction. Remember, I said share everything. Okay? Their feelings are only going to be hurt momentarily that they didn't get their item. You need people to challenge you. You have the right to say, no, we're going in this direction. And Patrick's book helps people understand that. Don't get personal in the debate. Purpose in life as a leader. It's about who you've lifted up and who you made better. It's about what you've given back. Given back to your career journey. That's a beautiful definition of a servant leader to their employees. Now, I think in America, organizations are doing a better job of getting people advanced training to try and uh, make them feel better part of the company and that they're growing in their careers and so forth. Um, but what I would say is that more often than not, more often than not, training is one of the first line items that gets whacked in the budget. Before advertising, before promotion, clearly before salaries, okay? And I would submit to you that it's not that hard to get more creative. Southwest Airlines, we never cut a training budget. I go to the six million dollar nonprofit, what training budget? I show up in February, fiscal year ends in June. Oh boy, I just inherited six months of current fiscal year, no training budget. Who watched the same movie or read the same book? And they've got a report also. We're cross-pollinating the learning we're cross-pollinating the learning. Now, I'll tell you, matter of fact, back in 89, I had him watch Shawshank Redemption. I'm not so sure that would be HR friendly today. But here's what I can tell you that is HR friendly today. The horse movie, Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit, for salespeople or anybody else, professional job. When you go back and look at Seabiscuit yourself and you think about how all these people had to work together to accomplish what they accomplished, okay? The other one, classic, just a classic, and this is going to blow your mind, The Sound of Music. Believe it or not, I have salespeople read The Sound of Music. Oh, sorry, watch The Sound of Music. Salespeople? Yeah. Julie Andrews was selling the kids and selling the colonel. Through persuasion. Persistence, persuasion, grace, right? Fantastic. And I guarantee you those two are uh, HR friendly. So, movies, books, if it's on the cheap. but. Be careful if you have traditional training budgets to send people to training. Don't see you in culture. Oh boy. You type you reds in the color code, the disc tests. Yes, 
A company is stronger if it's bound by love rather than fear. I hope we're all engaging in love and zero fear. But there's a neurology to practicing. Who are my athletes in here? Come on, high school, college, whatever. Okay? All right, who plays golf for crying out loud? Okay, more hands went up. You know that you've got to practice that swing. Okay? You know, what, what did you do, miss? Uh, in college? You were on the boys' golf team. Well, there you go. Talk about a lot of practice. Who else over here? Where's my gym, gymnast? No gymnast? There you go. This, I mean, that balance beam thing, forget about it, dude. <laughs> Look, it was all practice, and you were creating muscle memory from here to your back, to your arm, to your hip rotation, okay? Whatever you guys do in gymnastics that I don't fully get, but I have a high appreciation for it, okay? You with me over there on this side? Are you getting enough love? I need to come back over? Not enough love? Here's what I want you to do to create neurology, muscle, memory. Muscle memory here for here. You with me? Okay. Hotel housekeeping. I'm talking about people behind the scenes, folks. People behind the scenes. I say, listen, I want to thank you for the job you do. Made my experience, my stay, my dinner, my flight much better. Okay, this is important work that you do, and it is important work. There are people that won't go to a restaurant again if the bathroom's dirty. You feel me? Food can be great, not going back, right? Do this with strangers, my friends. If you do this with strangers, it is going to create that muscle memory from here to right here to where you will find yourself starting to provide more daily, more frequent praise to your employee group. It can even be a colleague, but certainly your direct reports, okay? They're gonna go home, they're gonna say, something's wrong with DC, why's that? Well, just out of the blue, he says, dude, I'm glad you're on our team. You're really doing good work. Oh, was it your review? No, he just showed up my. Here's another one. Pay attention to who's having a bad day that is in your care. You are leading them. They are in your care because you are their leader so that it will start to translate into your everyday work in your business. Okay? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'll take questions. Oh, boy. I didn't do a good job.